So Genesis chapter 25. Now, as I was reading this chapter, it's a long chapter, so we're probably going to go through it rather quickly. But I just want to uh, want to touch on something before we we get into the scriptures itself. Uh, I've themed it uh, reckless leadership. Reckless leadership. Now, now you would you would probably ask yourself, "Wow, reckless leadership? I mean, what what is the Bible teaching us?" Uh, because the ideal thing is to have perfect leadership, right? Uh, that's the ideal thing. That's the perfect will of the Lord, to be a man, to be a woman that, that deals with every situation perfectly, that, that's able to minister perfectly, that's able to counsel and comfort perfectly, that's able to lead a people perfectly. I mean, that's the ideal thing. And, and when we are totally surrendered to God, I think that it's possible, but I don't think it's probable. I mean, we just are human beings and we fail. We make mistakes. We don't always measure up to the word of God. And we have to understand that for ourselves to have grace and also to have grace for one another. Now, as you look at the leaderships in the scriptures, you find them reckless pretty much in, in, in all kinds of situations. Look at Adam. How reckless was he? Uh, he brought sin into the world. Not a good leader. A and he had no example except God which I thought was a pretty good example was, as a leader. You know, at least he wasn't uh, able to blame. Well, I blame that guy, Lord, that you put in front of me, you know, like many of us would probably do. But he had no one to blame. He had to suffer the consequences. <clears throat> and so he wasn't a great leader. But the fact is, God called him. And he led humanity in the beginning. And then you look at uh, someone like, and, and we can just, pick them out here, you know, someone like Noah, led very well in the beginning, a righteous man, God saw he was godly and gave him a plan to build a boat to save his family and anyone else that would be righteous, but everyone else wanted to do what was right in their own eyes. And so Noah was pretty faithful, not reckless at all until after, and then he became reckless. Uh, not a guy that you would probably want to follow, uh, sleeping with his daughters, um, <coughs> I think that's pretty reckless, but yet God called him with a great plan to save humanity, and he promised that that would never happen again. And you can just go down the line, David, Bathsheba, um, <coughs> the disciples, Peter. Paul had to rebuke Peter in Galatians chap chapter uh, 3 severely. Peter is sitting with the Gentiles, and he's enjoying the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, you know, these religious leaders come in, and they're all in their robes and, you know, walking around. And Peter sees them and says, oh, look at this, the religious guys. And he begins to side with them because they have status, prestige, whatever the reason is. He sides with them. And now he's sitting with them. And he, now he's offending the Gentiles. And Paul comes in, <coughs> and when you read it, he's pretty stern towards Peter. He is literally rebuked rebuking Peter, because Peter has not only done this to himself, but he's also misled Barnabas. He's also misled uh, some others there that are watching him. And so Paul just rebukes him. And so you see Peter kind of living recklessly with the grace of God. But yet, but yet God called him. And Peter did a great work. How do you reconcile those things? Because a lot of times we as people who sit in the pews and we watch leadership because it hasn't stopped. I can start naming some names today of pastors who have sat in big churches and taught them and have been pretty reckless and no longer are pastoring. And yet God called them. They have a big church and he used them and many have been saved through it. So how do we reconcile that as, as Christians, as children of God, as sitting in the pews? I mean, obviously, we make our choices to go to church because it's sometimes based upon that man. You know, he's committed. He's been solid. He's been there for years. We can trust the church. Others enjoy it. But yet, he could fail at any moment. And when someone fails, and maybe it, it's not a, a failure that's extreme, like I'm thinking or you're thinking, but maybe it's just a reckless leadership. You know, he doesn't always have the answers. doesn't always know what to do. He has the right heart and the right intent because he wants to do the right thing. 
And, and, and when you do the right thing, sometimes, and you probably know this, sometimes there's two things that could be right, or three things. And now it's your choice to pick which one you want to do, and you get information or counsel from others, and they have three things. You know? And of course, now you, you, you've asked others, and now you, they're hoping you take their advice, and so now you've got to try to appease them, and it's a tough place to be. Because you may please one, but the others are thinking, he's pretty reckless. He doesn't know what he's doing. But yet, God calls who he calls and puts in places where he wants him to be. It's God. So my point is this, that we have to take our eyes off men and put our eyes on God. Because men will always fail us. I if you are looking at church through the lens of what people are doing, then you're not going to find the perfect church. Whether it's the pastor, whether it's the leadership, whether it's people in ministry, or even just the congregation itself. We are here to do one thing, and that's just to worship Jesus. <clears throat> to give him our hearts and to love him. And if one fails, you know, we pray for them. We hope that they're restored. We bring them back, but it's not going to stumble us. It's not going to shipwreck us. We're going to continue to put our faith in Jesus Christ and not in leadership, even if it's reckless. And just because it's reckless doesn't mean that you have to leave because God called them. And that's an interesting one because a lot of times people will leave because it's reckless, because it's not what they think should be happening. But in reality, when we see God working in the life of an individual, no matter what they do, God's plan will be fulfilled. So we see Abraham here, and in this chapter, <clears throat> he's pretty reckless. He is so reckless that we're still feeling the repercussions of it because of the Arab nation. Uh, we're suffering. Christians are literally dying. They're being beheaded. Uh, <clears throat> women are being abused, and even children. I had to stop because there's children here. That's pretty reckless. Pretty reckless. But yet God called him. I, I don't understand that, but that's God's job. He's sovereign, and he knows what he needs to do. So we have a patriarch here. <laughs> we call him Abraham. He is the father of the Jews. And when you read about him in the New Testament, the Bible calls him righteous because he had put his faith in Jesus Christ, which I find just amazing how God views us through the lens of Jesus, and he sees us righteous and holy and presentable before him. How we need that for ourselves, don't we? <clears throat> we need to stop condemning ourselves. I know it's hard for some of us. We need to stop feeling as though we're useless or worthless or we can't do it. You know what? Just take a step of faith, and if you're a little reckless, God will work it out. You know, just, just, just do it. It's better to do it than not do it at all and do nothing. At least you tried to serve the Lord. But he's a patriarch. The word patriarch basically means the head of the tribe or the family, right? It's a term usually referring to the Israelite father of Abraham. And, and when you start uh, seeing that word, <coughs> it kind of diminishes as, as time goes on by. Uh, it's not really used of, of Isaac and Jacob too much or even the, the sons of Israel. But patriarch, that means the head of a home. <clears throat> In a sense, I'm a patriarch uh, of my home. <clears throat> and I can probably say I've been pretty reckless as a father, as a husband. But God has been very gracious to me to not allow my sins or my mistakes to overflow to my sons. And I thank God for that. But respect your patriarchs. Respect those who are your fathers or your forefathers or your grandfathers if they're alive. Respect them. Love them. Do the honor that's due them because they have lived that long and have endured through this life. We really need to. So as we look at the scriptures here, we're going to see the reckless life of Abraham, unfortunately. Um, we see in verses 1 and 4 that he remarries. And so in verse 1 it says, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. Now he's approximately 140 years old. <clears throat> so you're wondering, 
why does he need a wife? <laughs> He's an old guy now. Now you ladies are going, yeah, he, he needs no wife or a spouse. I think it's easier for ladies than it is for men to not have a spouse. Men need wives for various reasons. It was interesting because the guy, since, since I mentioned it earlier about this church and how we got it, the guy that sold it to us, his name was Roman. And um, <clears throat> I remember calling him up one day, and the guy's 75 years old. And I remember calling him up, and he's sitting in Starbucks, he tells me. And, and as he's sitting there, and we're talking about the deal here and what to do, all of a sudden he, he tells me, stop, stop. He says, you would think at 75 you would have no urge to look at a beautiful woman. That's what he told me. He goes, one just walked into Starbucks. And I'm like, dude, what are you telling me this for? But it was interesting, you know, it was interesting that at 75, he was still looking at beautiful women. And there are beautiful women out there. Uh, <clears throat> and unfortunately for, for men, it can be a stumbling block. It's interesting that her name means incense. So it gives you an idea that possibly Abraham was lonely. Possibly Abraham was drawn to her. Sarah has passed away. It's been a while. And so he needs to get married. And so he decides to get married to Ketorah, who is a concubine or his second wife. So he remarries. And then he has all these children, verse 2 through 4. And these are the second generation of Ketorah. And just enough to let us observe that these names, Medium, Sheba, Dedan, are names that are prominent as far as the Arab heritage is concerned. There, this is where we get the Medanites. And you remember the Medanites, Moses married one of them there at Mount Sinai. And it would seem that a part of the Arab people came from the union of Abraham and Keturah. This also brings up the subject of second marriage. And we'll get back to that in a minute here. But second marriage, <coughs> which Abraham does have, it happened back then, it happens today, can be very difficult. I have dealt with second marriages. If you can, please work out your first marriage as much as possible. Because if you think that was hard, wait till you get married for the second time. It is even more difficult than the first time. So if you can, work out your first marriage. You know how you do that? Simply fall in love with Jesus. Simply dedicate and surrender your life to knowing who he is. And everything else will fall in place around you. It really does work when you do it. When you don't do it and you're not reading but you say you're reading, when, you st when you're not praying and you're saying you're praying, you know, you'll find that it works when you really do it, when you really do it. We really need to do that. But it's not the marriage itself, but it's also the children that come along with it. The more difficulty is not with necessarily the wife or the husband, but the children and dealing with all of that. Because now who's responsible? Who has the authority? Who's the mom? Who's the dad? Very difficult to do, and I think that we see that here with Abraham, how difficult it was. He will literally separate Isaac from the rest of the children to protect him because he knows how corrupt and wicked these people are. We, we need to know, though, <coughs> that today, <coughs> as, as those who would have a second marriage have to embrace the children, of our spouse you really do you have to understand that they're God's children and God has given you the responsibility to lead them whether a husband or a wife and you are to treat them as though they're your own it's called adoption and we've all understood what adoption is at one point or another uh, Roman talks about a, a adoption in 815 it says but you received the spirit of adoption by which we call out Abba Father. We're adopted into the family of God. Israel is the true children of God. We are the adopted children of God. We've been grafted in. And yet God loves us just as much as he loves Israel. And, so, and we get to participate in the inher inheritance also as Israel. So, so we need to embrace those children that come from a second marriage. If you do come from a second marriage. Now verses 5 through 6 gives a division 
of Abraham's goods. And so it says in verse 5, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. So, so you see how much he loved Isaac. You see how much he understood that God called Isaac like he called Abraham. And so he purposely gives everything to Isaac there. But he gave gifts to the sons of the concubine, which Abraham had. While he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. And so he does that because he wants to protect Isaac from any problems that may happen. Now, question. Which two persons in the Bible cause a world catastrophe because of their sin? You could probably name Abraham as one of them because it's still happening to this day. The world is being destroyed because of his relationship with Keturah, because of his relationship with the concubine before Isaac was born. Still happening today. And the first would probably be Adam, because sin entered into the world, and we are all sinners because of his sin. So, so two men with the letter A in their name, you know, caused catastrophe in this world. Um, how sad. Reckless leadership, right? Oh, how we need to be careful in being much prayer. So moving on, verses 7 through 10, we see his age and death here. And of course, uh, Abraham's coming to the end of his life. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years. So he lived a pretty good life. 175 years is a long time, able to see a lot of the work of the Lord take place. And then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. <sighs> Death. <clears throat> Death could be very difficult for so many. I think death for an older person is easier to receive than death of a younger person. Because we look as death as missing and someone being gone or absent from us and we don't understand that death really is just moving address we're moving from one location to the next location and as believers we know that the person is just leaving us temporarily until we go home to be with them eternally but it is easier uh, to allow an older person to go in peace um I've seen that happen many times. My grandfather at 99 years old finally said, that's it, I want to go home. He had been begging my mom, I'm too old, I'm ready to go home. Please stop taking me to the doctors. Stop taking care of me. Finally, it got too bad that she had to put him into a home. And there at the home, he decided, I'm not eating. And of course, you, I don't know if you know this or not, but when you go into a home, if you decide not to eat, they're not going to force you to eat. They just don't do that. That's against your will. <coughs> so he ended up passing away very quietly and peacefully, I think. Uh, I've experienced death here with, with some of our, well, Patty's family. Um, just beautiful the way that they have gone home to be with the Lord. So peaceful. Uh, her mother, her father, um, just amazing how God's grace and mercy was there and how he ministered to the family because they all believed in Jesus Christ. And it was almost like a rejoicing because they moved from this life to the next. So we shouldn't be fearful of death at all, though it is difficult and hard and we should mourn. There's a time to mourn. Uh, I believe that Mary, Jesus' mother, mourned at the cross. She weeped. Mary Magdalene weeped. And so we should weep. But if you do have the faith and the strength not to, that's okay too, by the way. Because your faith is strong in the Lord and you know that they're not here. I remember hearing a story years ago, years ago. And one family decided to view the loss of their son as though he went on a mission field. Because he was a missionary and there were times where he was away for years, tens of years at a time because he'd go deep into Africa. And they wouldn't see him. They wouldn't communicate for quite a long time. And then all of a sudden he would come and they'd see him and they'd rejoice and you know, enjoy the fellowship again. But he passed away and they decided, you know what? He's on a missionary trip right now and we'll see him soon. And so that's how they, they were able to deal uh, with that situation. 
Abraham is old and God is calling him home. He's gathering to his people, the people of faith, who are waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise, the redemption through Jesus Christ that they look to, we look back to because of the work of Jesus Christ. Notice it says full of years. This Hebrew word really indicates a happy and content life. And so even though he's been through a lot, he's, he's pretty happy. He's pretty content. He could look back in life and see his legacy and go, not bad. I've had some good times. Yeah, I've had some bad times, but the good times just trump, no pun intended, the bad times. You know, they, they just were wonderful. My wife, Sarah, who I loved, cared for, my son, Isaac, even Ishmael. I loved him. God said he promise to bless him and he did and just where God led us and guided us and we saw God's hand working protecting us I mean it was a good life a good legacy how do you view your life I know I view my life as blessed I am content and I'm ready to go home to be with the Lord anytime uh, as a as a man being able to preach the gospel message on a daily basis that is a blessing beyond uh, I could have never have imagined, nor did I even dream of ever doing that. And then married to the one sweetheart that I had from age 13 to now 54. She's 55. She's older than me. Four beautiful, okay, let me rephrase that. Four handsome men that the Lord gave me uh, the responsibility, my wife and I, to raise. And then to see them loving the Lord. Yeah, there were some difficult times, some reckless leadership. Reckless childhoods too, <clears throat> bad mistakes, but to see the outcome today, the fruit that's coming from that, and the nine beautiful grandchildren, I mean, what more do you really need? You know, oh, it, yeah, it's nice to see how God moves in the church and the body and so forth, but I am, I am content like Abraham. I'm, I'm at total peace. Uh, I wish that the Lord would, would take me home, but apparently he has not decided to, and so he has more work to, to be done. But I think Abraham really fits right in Psalms 1. Blessed is the man that, that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatever or whatsoever he does shall prosper and it just seems he's like that tree he's planted by that river and God just blesses him and he brings forth fruit for the children of Israel verse 16 God promises with long life uh, with long life will I be satisfied in other words Abraham had made his place of refuge the eternal living God and as a result God blessed him with the very content life. What is a content life? Because I think we probably would all have different views of what a content life is, right? I just shared you mine. But I think a content life really for all of us is walking with God. Just walking with God. Wherever you're at, <coughs> whatever you're doing, just walk with God. And you could be a, a delivery truck driver. And your job is to take packages and to deliver them to homes and to businesses every day for 20 years. Now, that can get a little boring after a while, right? You might see some interesting things as you're driving down the roads, the beach, wherever it is you're working, but it can get a little boring. But if you have a different perspective, that you are literally walking with God every day, and that your job has been given to you as a gift from God, and you are to walk in your job as though you're walking with God. And every package becomes a gift to someone else. And you're delivering it with a smile and with joy that they would see you, possibly ask a question, you'd get an opportunity to share your faith. And, and believe me, you can start a conversation and get Jesus Christ in there very easily, very easily. And so we have to view life that way that everything we do we're walking with God because God preordained it he's given us the gifts the job that you have the things that you are gifted in the skills and so forth are all given to God even 
given to you by God to use for his glory. And so walk with him. Just walk with him wherever it is he's taking you. Adam walked in the garden with God. That's where he was at. He didn't get to build a boat. He didn't slay Goliath. He, didn't, he just walked with God. And so we need to just walk with God. And there's contentment there when you just walk with God. And I, and I know that because when I first got saved, man, I was just on fire for God. I wasn't on fire for Christianity. I wasn't on fire for a church. I didn't even, I've never even stepped into a Christian church. I wasn't on fire for a man or even Calvary Chapel. I didn't even know what Calvary Chapel was. I was just on fire for God. Who's God? Who's Jesus? I want to know him and I want to share him. And when you're on fire and walking with God, God takes care of everything else around you somehow. And if there's some commotion and thing happening, it's almost like, I don't really care. God will take care of that. I'm focused on this, walking with him. And he just seems to take care of it. I was sharing this morning that <coughs> that when we finally found this church, Calvary Chapel, Virginia and I and the kids went in on an Easter Sunday and then afterwards, I said to her, I found the place that I want to go because they're teaching the word of God. And she looked at me and said, I'm not going there. She goes, I'm going to go find a Catholic church. Now, I could have said, no, you're not. The Bible says you're to submit to me. You are my wife. And so you're going where I go. I could have said that. But see, she wasn't saved yet. What I said, because, and it, not because I'm smart. I was just so in love with God, I didn't really care about anything else. And so I said to her, oh, okay, go. Take, take the kids with you. I'll, I'm going here. And that was it. So she went to the Catholic Church the first time, and then she came back, and she said, and this, she's telling me afterwards the story, she said to herself, I've been trying to get him to go to church all these years, and now he's going to church, but he's going to another place. So she decided she's going to go with me. And that's how she started going. So when you just focus on God and walk with him, God takes care of the rest. He'll do that work and in his timing and his way. So what am I going to do tomorrow? Walk with God. That's it. So verse 9, And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mariam, in the field of Ephron, and the son of Zohar, the Hittite, in the field which Abraham purchased, from the sons of Heth, and there Abraham was buried, and Sarah his wife. Uh, we see here Ishmael and Isaac uh, literally are brought together, and that happens in funerals, right, where families come together, and hopefully there's, there's healing there too. So now God blesses Isaac. We now turn from Abraham. Abraham's life is done. The books are closed there, and now we move on to his son Isaac, and when the focus will be there in the coming chapters. It came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt in Ber Lahairach. Now, God is keeping his promise to Abraham, and now he begins to work in Isaac, his only begotten son. The Father is working in Jesus Christ, his plan to be fulfilled save men and redeem them and give them the opportunity to be reconciled unto God by putting their faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ. So this is the generations of Ishmael, <clears throat> verses 12 through 16. Um, I'm not going to read them because <laughs> I'll just butcher some of those, those names. So verse 16, uh, these were the son of Ishmael and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, 12 prince according to the nations. So we see the promise of God kept to Hagar and the generations to Ishmael. What does that tell us about God? He keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. So we can, we can believe and trust God to keep his promises. And whatever those, I'll never leave you and forsake you. So you can take that to the bank. God's not going to leave you or forsake you ever. You might feel like it, but he's not going to. He's given you gifts to use. He has a plan for your life. That's a hard one for us to, to grasp. He has a plan for my life. Okay, well, what is that plan? I really believe at this age it's to walk with God. We don't always know the plan of God. 
I mean, God doesn't just reveal it to us and then we just start walking it, right? It'd be nice, you know, if it was like college, you, you fill out an application, you give them all your likes and dislikes and, you know, check boxes, and then all of a sudden they, they, they look at it all, they put it through the computer, and it comes out, okay, this is what you're called to do. You're called to be a, a structural engineer based upon all of the things that you're, you know, telling us. It's like, oh, that'd be nice if we just did that with God. He says, oh, this is what you're going to do, you know, but he doesn't do that because I think he's more concerned about the walk than fulfilling his plan because God is more concerned about your faithfulness to him. Just be faithful where you're at and walk with him and the plan will unfold as you're walking with him. But he keeps his promises. He definitely does. So now <coughs> his age and death, verse 17 and 18, these were the years of the life of Ishmael, 100 and 37 years and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people they dwelt in Havaf as far as Shur which is east of Egypt as you go towards Assyria he died in the presence of all the brethren now it's interesting that the word die there in the Hebrew is different than the word die for Abraham for Abraham it was a death of content a death of joy and peace, fulfillment. But in this word, the word death here is fell. He just fell. It was done. A little different <coughs> when you're in the will of the Lord, when you're with the Lord. Isn't that true of today? We have hope in death, but you look to a person that has no hope. They have no God. Death to them, is, they're gone. They fell. It's kind of like uh, what Solomon said in, um, I believe, uh, Lamentations, where he's talking from the earthly perspective, right? That man is just like a dog. It just gets buried in the ground, and it exists no more. And that's how they view it, but we don't view it that way. So as far as they're concerned, uh, Ishmael, he just fell. He's gone. You know, sad that they have no hope like we have hope in Jesus Christ when we leave this place. So this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Now we'll see Esau's generation uh, genealogy come in chapter 36 later on. Um, and un until um, 37, we'll find the account of Jacob as Isaac will have two children here. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife. And Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah his wife conceived. Isn't it interesting that she's barren now? Sarah was barren. It just seems like we got a lot of barren women in the promises of God. Well, why would God use that? And, and again, I think it comes back to him receiving the glory in that he keeps his promises. He's doing something that's a little hard for human beings to do. You know, Abraham went and tried to do it himself, and that was a reckless mistake. And so God does it. And so he takes barren women and he performs a miracle so that they'll know that it's God's child and God's plan and promises uh, to that individual. And I love that when God does that. And it's not my hands working it out to try to work something up. And I ha we have to be careful of that. But yet, I'm struggling with it right now. You know, our, our brother Forrest is doing <laughs> a great job by the leading of the Lord. And I want to get in there and really stir it up so it just keeps going. But maybe it's a revival for us, for this church, and for some of our family members uh, to stir us up. Maybe some of us were getting lazy. Maybe some of us were thinking, this isn't working out for me. You know, I don't know. But maybe it was for us. Maybe it was for me too. Or maybe it is bigger. I don't know. I don't know. It's difficult, and I don't want to get in there and mess things up. As someone said today, it seems like you're trying to pull the horse a little bit harder. And I think, man, and I'm looking at it like I'm trying to push the horse a little bit more. So perspective, right? And I'm just thinking, okay, Lord, where do I fit in this? I don't want to overstep my boundaries, and I just want you to lead. Like Lowe's, just he lead, you know, and they donated all the stuff, and they're just leading. And I, and I really do, I, I really want that. I think when you allow the Lord to lead by the Spirit, then you're not reckless. You're just waiting on the Lord. I, I know it almost 
gets gets um, what's the word am I looking for uh, from those that are, are waiting on leadership to move it, it gets uncomfortable uh, we get impatient we say, why don't they just let us know let us know tell us you know and I totally understand that because I want to know too but I'm waiting on the spirit to just move at the same time and, and trying to let him move and not me move him myself so it's a hard place to be and I encourage you try it try it in your life let the Holy Spirit just lead you don't don't make quick decisions wait on God to open up a door or shut a door you know and, and let it be the perfect will of the Lord sometimes we want to buy a house we want to buy a house and, and so we're like forcing our way to buy a house instead of stepping back and say Lord which house do you want me to buy where do you want me to live I know we don't think like that, but where do you want me to live and how can I impact my community, my neighbors? We had an opportunity to buy a house over closer to Modesto. We were looking at it, nice house. But the Lord said, no, don't want you to get in that house. Then we saw another house over here and the Lord said, no. And then we walked into the real estate office on Lucretia and they said, we got a house here and we can give you a second with a balloon payment, and it would you would qualify. So we so the Lord opened the doors so we could go in there. So we bought that house. Yeah, we it was crazy, but we did it. And He had us right where He wanted us, and that was when we started Calvary. And the Lord w again, I was so on fire. So pretty much everybody in my neighborhood got saved. The person next to the people that lived there, person next to me. Lisa's the only one that has not been saved yet. And then some other people, and then on this side got saved, across the street got saved, this person got saved, and then the two-story, uh, they got saved, radically got saved. They all got on their knees and accepted Jesus Christ. But then you look at it and you go, wow, God put me right where I needed to be. Put me right where I needed to be. So we really need to let the Holy Spirit do that and move us. Uh, doesn't mean that we need to move because sometimes we need to move. You know, those quick decisions, you know, help, Lord, the boat's sinking. I need help now, that type of thing. And we trust in God that he's leading us. Verse 22 through 23, the children, this, these two children are, are battling. Oh, I'm not going to get, I'm going to get done here. Okay, verse 22, but the children struggled together within her, so in the womb of Rebekah. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And so he's talking about uh, Jacob and uh, Esau. And there's two nations in there. And already within the womb, they're battling against each other. But the younger will serve the older, which is unheard of in, in the Jewish community. He's usually the older one. I had a man one time come to me, and he looked at me and says, you're a firstborn, right? And I says, yeah, how did you know? I could just tell. God has anointed you to be a leader. And then he went on to say, your pastor shouldn't be pastoring. You should be there because he's not a firstborn. And I'm kind of like, okay, you're messed up. <laughs> you, don't know what, you don't know what you're talking about because when you really read the scriptures, there were a lot of leaders that weren't firstborn. David was not a firstborn. He, he went through all the brothers and finally got to David. So be careful. Really read the scriptures. And so there's this struggle, this battle going on. Um, we can even look at it as a battle of the flesh and the spirit. The flesh is battling with the spirit. Uh, we as individuals, we battle with our flesh and then our walk with the Lord. And the one we feed the most is the one that will win. And that is true. The birth of Esau and Jacob, verse 24. So when her days were full, fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red and was like a hairy garment all over. Uh, reminds me of Liam. My my last grandson, God, that guy had a full set of hair. You could literally have cut it, and he would have had a flat top. I mean, that's how much hair he had. Amazing. He's, he, he was hairy. And so they called him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. 
So one was red and another one was a surplanter or, or a heel catcher in the Hebrew. But Jacob was from the very beginning one who took his position. He literally pulled him from the heel back so that he could be the firstborn. He really wanted it uh, in his flesh. And we'll, we'll see that as we continue to go on here. So the boys grew, verse 27, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a wild man, dwelling, or mild man, dwelling in tents. Um, some time has gone by. Skill hunter, you don't become a skill hunter immediately. It takes time, it takes years to become a skilled hunter. Um, so it, we don't know exactly how long has gone by, but it has gone by. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, this is interesting. Isaac loved Esau because of what he could give him. Rebekah just loved Jacob. Just loved him. It's a difference, a big difference. And sometimes we love people because of what they can give us. That's easy to do instead of just loving people. And by the way, God just loves us. We don't have to do anything for him at all. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to be good looking. You could be the ugliest person in the world. And <laughs> he still loves you because God is love. God is love. And that's the love that we need to have for one another. That same love that that uh, Rebecca had for Jacob, um, and you see it in their relationship with one another compared to Isaac and and Esau. In fact, Isaac, I don't know this for sure, but almost allowed himself to be manipulated in a sense because he wanted that game. <laughs> and uh, though he may have been blind. You know, and he's touching Jacob's and, oh, he's hairy. You know, I don't know. Just just a thought. Not not gospel, so just discard it if, if you don't, if you like. So Jacob uh, cooked stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that red or that same red stew for I am weary. Therefore, his name is called Edom. So Jacob liked to cook, of course. He hung around his mother quite a bit, so he learned how to cook very well. And Esau asked him for some food, but Jacob said, sell me your birthright. I mean, this is his, this is his flesh, and he's a conniver. He, he wants that birthright. I'm sure his mother is kind of edging him on at the same time. And so Esau's a hunter. He really doesn't care about the birthright. And he said, look, I'm about to die. So he's one of these guys, you know, uh, Typical man, if when you're hungry, just give me something to eat now because I'm hungry now. I'm about ready to die. So, so what's his birthright to me? And Jacob says, swear to me as this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. You know, a caring brother, right, would have just said, oh, here, brother, have some stew. I love you. But he took the opportunity to manipulate. I mean, that was callous and calculating on his part to try to get what he wanted and by the way he already had it God had already promised it to Jacob he didn't need to manipulate anything God already said that you will be the person to bring the line of Christ and sometimes God's already given it to us but we're not patient enough to wait for it to be fulfilled and we need to wait on the Lord and his timing because there's so much that you have to learn about waiting and trials, faith, and, and not necessarily learn about others, but learn about yourself and how weak you really are and where your weaknesses are so that you can pray more and find strength more in the Lord. But we really need to wait. But he wouldn't wait. He wanted his birthright right now so that he could uh, claim that. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew and lentil. Then he ate and drank rose and went his way thus Esau despised his birthright and we're going to stop there <clears throat> e 
Esau is a type of the flesh. The flesh does not care about the spiritual things. Who cares about birthrights? Who cares about promises? Who cares about the plan of God? See, the flesh doesn't care. But the spirit, the spirit desires the fulfillment of the Lord, desires the will of the Lord. <clears throat> See, in you and in us is the spirit of God. And God creates a hunger in us for him, to know him and to know his will for our lives. And we need to spend time in those areas, as I said earlier, walking with God so that we know him and know the will of, for our lives. But that means surrendering your lives to him completely. Now, when I say that surrender, I'm not saying you have to leave everything, come to church and serve here. Some of you might be thinking that. What I'm saying is surrender your daily life to him and walk with him. Whatever it is he has you doing at that time, whatever it is you do. If you're a delivery driver, then do it for his glory and walk with him. If you're a salesman, then do it for his glory and walk with him. And if God is leading you to be a part of the church, then be a part of the church and serve in the church and fulfill that also. But just surrender your life to him, whatever his will is for your life, as long as you're walking with him and glorifying him in your life. Let the spirit lead you and not the flesh because the flesh wants it now and that's when you get into trouble 